Well, good evening. Um, we may have some more people coming in as we go, but we want to get started. My name is Vern Fish, currently the uh, president of the Friends of Wabakimi, uh, working out of Waterloo, Iowa. This is our first uh, webinar in a series. Um, I can get my advance here. This is going to be number one, and we have two excellent speakers tonight. But I also want to keep you in mind that we have other uh, webinars coming up, when, one on December 12th, one on December 19th, which is actually with uh, park staff. Uh, we also will uh, we'll have MJ, who's on the call tonight, will be doing planning from scratch on, in January. Uh, we have Julie Bourne with the Ohio Nature will be here on January 30th, and then I'll, I'll end this more. And then we have Gary Racy, who's also on the call, talking about caribou. That'll be on February 13th. And then I'll be doing... Uh, the last presentation on February 27th on the uh, basically a trip down the Otter Tooth following the trail, a voyage of Edward uh, Unfredville. So uh, the presentation tonight, though, is with um, Ms. McFarland and, and Joe. And uh, I know that um, uh, Mahari, if I'm saying that right, and I probably am not, she'll correct me, but she was on the, uh, on the Albany. And I feel very fortunate I got to do part of her trip previously. So it's a beautiful river. Um, we have, so we have two paddlers. Um, they went across Wabakimi in different directions, Joe and his daughter. Uh, Joe is uh, with the Missouri Department of Conservation, and he works on federal programs in the state of Missouri. And then, uh, again, I'm probably butchering uh, Ms. McFarland's first name, Mahari, and she is actually has her degree from, uh, from Scotland, and she's now been working with Nature Conservancy in Canada since March of 08. And uh, she went from east to west, and um, uh, Joe and his daughter went from west to east. So we got two different trips here, and hopefully you, you recognize Iron Falls. Uh, that's a beautiful place. I got to spend the night there. So, but I also want to talk briefly about one of the things that the Friends is doing, which is a joint fundraising project that we're doing with the park, and it is uh, to uh, work on putting some signage in the park. And we've been raising money for that. And I believe that number is outdated. We're past 6,000 and Dave can talk about that a little more, but this is a, a cooperative effort with the park. They're gonna provide some of the funding. We're helping raise the money. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why that kiosk is important. And you can go to our website to really scan those things. Um, but uh, we also can take uh, Canadian donors can, can contribute directly and use it on your taxes in Canada. And that's also on our website. So I just wanted to make sure that you recognize that we are raising money. If you want more information, go to the website. So with that, I'm going to ask Ms. McFarland if you want to go ahead and share the screen and um, get, your, get your slide up there. And hopefully the system is working for us. And if you haven't muted yourself, I would hope you would, please. Uh, it helps uh, cut down on background noise. And we also are recording tonight, so be aware. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end. And I think we're almost there. Dave, do you want to add any more introductory comments before we uh, let our speaker go? Well, just to say with our current fundraising effort, we're now at $6,950, uh, which is doing very well. We're, our goal was to reach 8,000 Canadians. So we're open to having a few more contributions to meet our goal. And I believe it's very McFarlane and Brant did a wonderful trip and they also sent us some pictures of them doing clearing some portages and doing some heavy duty saw work. So that's a very important thing. And Joe and his daughter, Caroline, they're gonna talk later. So we're trying to start Joe at 735. So with that, um, very uh, take it away, it's all yours. Great, thanks so much. Um, can I have a thumbs up to check that you can hear me okay? Yep, yes. sounds good, great. Well, thanks very much for having me here tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, we have a whole bunch of fun experiences and some pretty pictures to share from our trip in Wabakimi this past summer in 2021. Um, I figured to start off um, just with a quick introduction as to who I am. Um, so my name is Barry McFarlane. Um, the spelling is not helpful. It's pronounced with a V just to confuse everyone. Um, as you may have worked out by now, I grew up in Scotland. Um, I then did a PhD in South Africa on birds um, and then moved to London, Ontario, um, Southern Canada in 2006. 
I'm currently the Director of Science and Stewardship with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. We're Canada's largest um, land conservation charity, um, working coast to coast um, to coast, protecting um, special, special lands and habitats right across Canada. Um, so that's what I do during my day job and on vacation, I do pretty similar things, it turns out, um, with the addition very recently of this canoeing business. So we started canoeing like many other people that were stuck in Ontario due to COVID um, on the 1st of July, Canada Day, a very appropriate day to start canoeing apparently, um, 2020. Um, and so in 2020, we did a five day backcountry trip in Algonquin Provincial Park in central Ontario and then nine days back country in Quetico Provincial Park, so just across the, the border from Boundary Waters. Um, so we figured, well, Quetico was a little bit busy. We, we saw, I don't know, at least five or six other parties of people, so we figured we'd go somewhere a bit quieter. So it seemed really obvious to jump into an 18-day back country trip in Wabakimi Provincial Park. Now, obviously, this sounds completely nuts, but um, it's not quite as nuts as it sounds. We, we do have an extensive backcountry experience um, in wilderness areas, um, mostly very terrestrial, though. Um, this is us up on some ridiculous mountain in New Zealand um, about almost 10 years ago now. Um, we have done some whitewater instruction courses. We have our wilderness first aid, all of these bits and pieces. So it's not quite as nutty as it first seems to leap into a boat and then almost immediately do a really long trip in Wabakimi. So um, largely my husband put together a whole bunch of resources to try to work out what kind of trip would be fun and exciting, but hopefully not too exciting. Um, pulling on a variety of resources like these ones that you can see on, on the slide here. The key thing to note is that a lot of these are actually, you know, not super recent, um, which turned out to be quite relevant, um, but lots of great information um, online and in print um, that you can kind of cobble together. Um, we're also incredibly grateful to the Wabakimi project. I know many of you on the call here are probably super familiar with that. Many of you probably participated. Um, it is really quite a Herculean volunteer initiative um, to document canoe routes and portages throughout Wabakimi and the surrounding Crown land, um, initiated back in 2004 by Phil Cotton. And 14 consecutive seasons of volunteer effort is really pretty spectacular. Um, so big shout out, big thanks from Brent and I for all of those efforts and, and long may those efforts continue to occur across these really exciting landscapes. Um, in terms of maps, um, it was also a lot of cobbling together from a lot of different sources um, in print and online. Um, Paddle Planner is a really great resource for cobbling together a, an online version of the route that you're proposing. Um, so this is, a, is a, an example of the map that my husband put together um, lots of copying and pasting and PowerPoint, um, copying um, bits and pieces of information that he derived from a whole bunch of sources and popping it all together on one, one page. Um, and of course, it wasn't just one page, it was 18 days of constant travel. So it was actually many, many pages um, of these, these nice maps um, that he, he put together with all this information. Um, in terms of how we navigated in the field, um, we also downloaded Gaia GPS. This is an app that you can get for smartphones. Um, for about a $20, 20 Canadian annual subscription, it allows you to download topographic maps so that you can access them offline. Um, of course, we didn't rely on that for our navigation. We also had two copies of our paper maps, one that was hidden away in a dry bag and the, the versions that we needed for the day out in our, our map. Um, we also had a Garmin inReach, which was our, our backup safety device so that we could send, we could send daily we're safe at camp messages um, to our outfitter and also a web link out to friends and family. Um, so this is just a screen capture of what the Gaia GPS app looks like on your smartphone. This is our whole route. Um, I'll explain what all of those funny squares are as well afterwards. Um, and zoomed in a little bit more detail, you can get pretty decent amounts of detail. Um, we pre-populated it with possible campsites, um, and that's our, our colored line is our route from Paddle Planner. Um, and all of those red blobs are Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas point count stations, which I'll chat about later. Um, and in case you're wondering, we had a little solar panel with us to keep our phones and, and other batteries charged um, so that we could keep that as a backup and emergency device. 
terms of food, food's quite important to us, especially when we're out having adventures in the wilderness. Um, so it was 18 days and, and two humans. Um, the cat did not come, although he may have thought he wanted to. Um, we had about 30 kilograms of largely dehydrated food, which we, um, we being my husband, um, cooked and dehydrated all over last winter. Um, we also had a, a you know, important, important adult beverages in the form of some port and some bourbon, which um, we actually brought most of it back because the trip was so arduous that we um, didn't actually feel like drinking. Um, and we stored this, of course, in dry bags, which we hung via pulley system on the rare occasions we actually found trees suitable to do a safe bear hang. Um, so we live in London and southwestern Ontario, so it's a two-day drive for us to get up to beautiful Wabakimi. Um, we stayed in Matisse Lake Outfitters the night before, um, and um, he dropped us off at the very south end, at the very beginning of our, our trip, at the south end of Little Caribou Lake on the 21st of June. Um, and the many of you in the audience, I'm sure, are much more experienced than us, will be like, these guys are completely crazy. Why are they going out at, at peak bug o'clock? Um, but as I'll talk about uh, shortly, we wanted to contribute um, as volunteers to the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and this is a, a five year initiative to document breeding birds throughout Ontario. And this is th this last year was the first year of, of a five year data collection effort. So peak bug o'clock is, of course, also peak bird breeding season. So that was why we went out then. Um, this is our boat. Um, we may or may not call it Boaty McBoatface. It will, it will probably get some kind of whimsical name at some point. Um, it's an H2O uh, Voyager 17 foot um, that's made in Tavistock, which is just up the road from us in Ontario. Weighs sort of just under 30 kilos, 55 to 60 pounds um, in old school units. So this was us right at the start. Um, I think I saw a very similar photo um, from the other speaker's trip report. Um, this is right at the very beginning at the very south end of Little Caribou Lake. Um, we had, um, for those of you that are, are interested in our, our gear, I'll, I'll have a few slides with various bits of gear things as we go. Um, we had a two 100 liter mech dry bags, two backpacks, and then a couple of, sort of smaller bags for our cameras and, and odds and ends. And of course, three paddles, which I know can safely or um, happy to, to announce that we did return safely with all of our gear. Um, all of our paddles are still paddleable um, and so forth. So that was quite exciting. Um, a little bit more on gear. Um, I mentioned that we used our smartphones a fair amount as kind of a backup navigation device. I used mine a lot for photographs and for submitting to iNaturalist and eBird, which I'll chat about later. Um, so just a few tips on that. Um, we keep them on airplane mode the whole time and battery saver mode, and that really helps eke out the battery. Um, but of course, we had um, a battery pack to, to keep them charged and then the solar panel to, to charge them up in turn. Um, so you can submit data to these online platforms once you get back um, into connectivity. Um, and of course, the probably the most important thing of all of this is a lanyard so you can have it attached to yourself. Um, should you have any adventures, either terrestrial or aquatic adventures. Um, I also carry a DSLR with me. Um, so the two summers that we've been canoeing, including some white water stuff now, then I've managed to, to lug this thing along. Um, it lives inside its think tank holster. Um, and when it's kind of sketchy or scary or windy or rapids or whatever, then it also gets packaged up into this dry bag, um, which has so far been, been adequately more than adequately robust in terms of dryness and protection um, in scary conditions. Um, and probably the most important thing for digital photography while canoeing is to have some kind of auto steer. Um, in this case, it's my husband, Brent, um, who is incredibly patient with me doing all sorts of steering while I try to get a better photo of the bird or the plant or the, the moose or the bear or whatever it happens to be without disturbing the animals and without dropping anything important into the water. So just a quick snapshot of our route. Um, I mentioned we started at Little Caribou Lake, right at the south end. So there's road access down to here. Um, so we got dropped off, um, our car got driven back to the outfitter. Um, and just a rough order of the, the lakes and things that we passed through um, on the way, basic, basically north, but obviously not the most direct route north, um, um, cross up to the Michikai River and then into the Albany River. And then we got picked up by float plane, by our outfitters on Miminuska Lake. 
on the I think 8th of July or something like that. Um, it was pretty quiet, um, as many of you are hyper aware, I'm sure, that with the US border being closed um, for a big chunk of time, then a lot of the tourism industry up in this area was, was severely reduced. Um, there are several fly and fishing lodges throughout the park, and as far as we could tell, quite a few of them were closed during COVID because of the border being closed. Um, according to the park website, they get about 700 backcountry visitors a year, and I imagine it was possibly a chunk less than that this year. Um, and we saw no humans at all between day two and day 16, which I think is probably the longest I've gone not seeing another human apart from my husband. Um, but most of the time we're so busy paddling or trying to cut through portages that we didn't actually notice how we felt about that. So, um, yeah, so here's an arbitrary pretty picture. Um, the first day, it kind of, or the first week or so, was pretty much headwinds the whole way. Um, and I think this was one of the first evenings when the wind finally calmed down and we had this beautiful sunset. Um, it was calm and still and, and really wonderful. Um, I mentioned already a little bit about portages. And if you've read our trip report, you'll already know that it was a pretty arduous trip. Um, Portages are maintained by a couple of four, four team members, um, teams that in a partnership with local First Nation communities. And as far as I can tell, each route is maintained approximately every two years as kind of a cycle throughout the park. And I'm sure many of you are much more familiar with that than I. Um, and many of them were, were absolutely fantastic, beautiful footpaths like the one on the right here, um, through really wonderful habitat, really nice little narrow tra trails that were really easy to find. Um, unfortunately, some of them also looked like this during our visit, um, and this is absolutely not a criticism of the, the portage maintenance. Um, we have some colleagues that, that work for the forestry in the forestry industry, and, and there's some research that could suggest that there might be a, a frequency of tornadoes in the boreal forest that we're, we're not necessarily, we don't necessarily know that much about. Um, so we did encounter an area of pretty substantial blowdown that we did actually wonder if some kind of tornado or at least some kind of significant wind event of some sort had whipped through. Um, so the beautiful Portage Trail is somewhere underneath this tangle of, of spruce trees that are all conveniently lying on top of one another. Um, so we, we did manage to wrangle the canoe through all of these places and ended up in all sorts of wacky situations where canoes really don't belong. Um, we were extremely glad that we had this neat little folding saw and an axe. Um, the dumb thing that we didn't do was bring a spare blade for our saw or a sharpening stone for the axe. So those are definitely things that will be packed on every subsequent trip. Um, so lots of lots of kind of individual blowdowns as well here and there. This was a, a big um, a tree that had come down and kind of pulled up its root mass and created this kind of wall of of peat and moss right across the trail, which we kind of had to cut a little window through to, to regain the route. Um, our worst day of this was um, going from Coleman across into Rockcliffe. Um, and there's a, a 750 meter portage and a 350 meter portage. And clearing them and moving all of our stuff over that took us seven hours in total. Um, so that was a pretty brutal day. And I think it was all because of this one probably just one wind event that it just absolutely nailed the trees in that that area. Um, we did get to stop and Brent cooked up some wonderful bannock um, for lunch partway through this so that it wasn't a continuous seven hour slog but it was it was definitely a pretty long day. Um, and the very last bit of that portage of course is the the famous or perhaps inf infamous portage down into Rockcliffe Lake um, which is a, a fairly close to vertical rock rocky slope that's partly vegetated so we had to lower the canoe down on on a pulley system so this wasn't a surprise we knew that this was coming but it was quite a sting in the tail after seven hours of pretty epic um carrying and and portage clearing and we still had to forget like five or ten kilometers of paddling to do after that until we eventually found a campsite which was conveniently part way up a cliff at quarter to ten at night um, so needless to say, there wasn't a very early start the next day for any early morning birding. Um, I mentioned that we knew we were there during peak bug o'clock and um, just to reiterate, our trip was the 21st of June to the 8th of July. Um, and we had them all, I think, or almost all. We had black flies, we had mosquitoes, we had deer flies, we even had one or two stable flies at some point as well. Um, and this was the, the inner, inner side of our fly um, on the tent one morning. 
Um, but not nearly as bad as it could have been, to be honest. Um, we quite, ha quite happily contribute to the food chain occasionally. Um, unfortunately, I react to black flies, so I did have to spend one day not actually being able to see out of one eye and relying very heavily on Brent's ability to steer from the back of the boat, um, because this is what happens when I get a black fly bite in my face, which is lots of fun. Um, but it was fun, I promise. Um, we were really grateful to have um, a Eureka no bug zone shelter. So it's this kind of futuristic looking tent thing, which is a, a cool bug shelter. Um, we used a paddle joiner to hold up one end and a, a, a tent pole at the other end. And this was fantastic. It gave us a, a, a lot of respite for cooking and kind of faffing around with our gear during kind of peak buggy times of day, like at the end of the day and first thing in the morning. Um, in this case, on the Albany River, it was also quite a good rain shelter or one giant thunderstorm. We were quite snug and dry in, in here. Um, and Brent was able to kind of cook stuff up and we could organize all of our gear in moderate shelter from both rain and bugs. So I mentioned the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. So um, just a quick um, mention of that a bit more for those of you that might not be familiar. Um, the whole province of Ontario is divided up into 10 by 10 kilometer squares. That's these squares that you can see on the map underlying our route. Um, and the idea is that volunteers from, you know, wherever that have some birding experience can contribute to collecting data on which species of bird and what density of those species are breeding in each of these squares across the whole province. And these data are used to inform population trends of birds and inform conservation action that we might need to take to, to keep our feathered friends happy. Um, and the volunteer effort is augmented with these automatic recording units or ARUs. So these are little devices that you can put out and leave them overnight and they come on in the morning and automatically record the, any noise that occurs um, during that dawn chorus. Um, so we volunteered um, to, to do this. We, we, we borrowed a couple of these song meters and which were pre-programmed to record at dawn and dusk. And so we put them out um, on trees, usually around our campsites, um, took some habitat photos to get an idea of the habitat that we were sampling. And in theory, we we're supposed to install them about 200 meters from the edges of a habitat. So 200 meters away from the edge of the, the water, 200 meters away from any kind of change in habitat type. Um, so in practice, that was sometimes really straightforward, like in the photo on the top left, a nice open burn there. It was pretty easy to walk 200 meters through that and find a tree and jam the thing up. Other areas, like in the middle photo, not quite so straightforward. So we, we did the best we could um, and we got them out on, I think, 13 or 14 of our, our nights that we were out. Um, ideally, they're attached to a big tree, but you know, any old shrub will do. This was an alder thicket on the edge of the Albany summer where we jammed a song meter for a night. Um, and of course, I augmented all the data from the song meters with kind of live um, um, e-bird checklists. So I was constantly, well, I'm constantly looking at birds anyway, but up here I was focused on trying to see if birds were up to anything that would let me know if they were building a nest or if they were feeding young or something like this. So for example, this northern flicker was busy excavating his nest hole right in one of our campsites. So that was a really easy piece of data that I could submit to the atlas. Um, Northern water thrushes were everywhere. These guys were singing their heads off the whole time. Um, this one was particularly agitated. So I suspect it had a nest or, or some chicks around because it was yelling at me and trying to get me to move faster along the portage. Um, we found lots and lots of golden eyes. Um, the Michikai River looks like a golden eye factory. There were cute little baby ducklings all over the place. It was super cute. Um, we found a couple of sets of trumpeter swans that had, had young, so that was a really nice um, record. These guys are making a bit of a comeback in Ontario after being very close to extirpated for a while. Um, I also submitted a lot of information to iNaturalist. So this is a, an online platform where you can submit photos of or sound recordings of any living species that you find anywhere in the world. And it uses a mixture of artificial intelligence and volunteer um, contributors to help identify the thing that you've seen or heard. Um, so I play around with iNaturalist a fair amount. Um, I added over, over 170 observations to the Wabakimi Provincial Park project and of course documented stuff all along the Albany and Michikau as well. Um, and this is super fun, it can get really addictive, um, but it's also a really valuable contribution to our understanding of where species occur throughout the world. 
and of course um, conservationists like myself at the Nature Conservancy of Canada and um, Ontario Provincial Parks and everyone else around the world are able to use those data to to work out how best to conserve key areas or look at areas that are really important to conserve because of some of the species that people have have documented in this way. Um, and in Ontario, and I'm sure elsewhere, but you can check out the Ontario Provincial Park leaderboard and see if you can bump your favorite provincial park kind of up the, the, the leaderboard a little bit by submitting a whole bunch of observations. Um, Algonquin Provincial Park already has hundreds and hundreds of observations, so you might not change its status very much, but places like Wabakimi don't have very many iNaturalist observations in them at all. So any kind of information that you, you can find is actually really valuable to places like this, and especially as we think about the other adjacent lands that, that should be being conserved. Um, so yeah, so just a little gear tip, you can still collect observations in airplane mode, um, just need to make sure that the GPS on your phone is, is automated, is, is activated, I should say, um, or if you're using just a regular camera, then just make sure you write down the coordinates of where your observation was. And this works for plants, mammals, mollusks, invertebrates. Um, we found, I think, actually two snakes on our whole trip. Um, first ever luna moth I've ever seen alive, so all of these things got to go into iNaturalist. A um, little bit more about gear. Um, with iNaturalist, you can, as I mentioned, you can just grab a photo of any living organism or take a photo of the back of your, your big camera. If you have a DSLR like I have, then you can grab a photo of the, the, the preview of the, cam of the camera um, and document that in iNaturalist and kind of sort everything out once you're back um, with Wi-Fi connection. Um, and of course, it's always good to have a backup notebook in case all of the technology fails, which it does sometimes. Um, so just a few quick photos of some of the fun wildlife we saw. This is a really crappy photo, but I was extremely excited to see my first ever woodland caribou. And this is a probably a female with a calf um, swimming along. Um, I can't remember if it was actually in, in Caribou Lake or if it was in Wabakimi Lake, but it was somewhere quite appropriate. And anyway, I think it was actually just outside the park. Um, so we were lucky to see these animals a couple of times, um, always very distantly, but these are a species at risk in Ontario and indeed Canada. Um, so really exciting to see these guys um, breeding successfully and, and hopefully doing, doing well in this big protected area. Came across quite a lot of bears. Um, this was a bear that um, I had a rather close encounter with while I was birding. I guess I was concentrating too much on what that female warbler was doing and not so much on whether there was a bear close by, but we had a chat and he ran off. Um, lots and lots of moose as well. This is a really pretty um, bull moose um, on the Michigan River that I don't like to disturb animals, but it's really hard to do anything else on a twisty river when you're being carried along by the current and we surprised this guy coming around a corner and he, he ran off. Um, quite a few otters towards the end of our trip, um, none for the whole trip and then I think the second last day we saw three or four sets of otters that were moderately curious and super cute. Um, this is one of the two snakes I saw, a super um, red orangey garter snake. Uh, lots of nice wildflowers, twin flowers are really common boreal kind of circumboreal plants, but um, they were in full bloom while we were, were traveling, so it was really a real treat to see those guys. Um, I'd never seen these guys before, tall bluebells. This was in behind Iron Falls. This is a, a really biodiverse spot on the trip. Um, lots of really neat plants, lots of moths, lots of other insects, super cool spot. I wish we'd had a bit more time to, to spend there. Um, and right on our very last morning, um, Brent spied these big white lumps. I was still snoozing in the tent, and he's like, you know, don't worry, I don't think they're about to leave, but I think there's some big white birds, they're either pelicans or swans, they're super far away. Um, and I got the binoculars out and right enough, there were American white pelicans. So that was a real treat to see right at the end of the trip. Um, in terms of kind of water conditions and river conditions, this is the Ogoki River. Um, I think we did actually paddle a little rapid, um, but as you can possibly see, the water levels were actually pretty low for, for most of our trip, probably probably a good foot below the kind of pollen stain on the rocks, um, which did make for some interesting challenges here and there. Um, the other challenge was, um, as I mentioned before, about some of the portages were a little bit challenging. So um, this was our choice um, at one point early on in the Michikau, the, the water was super low. So it was basically a bump and grind and drag down this rapid or go through this portage, which we could not find at all. Um, so we chose the bump and grind, um, which was, you know, 
possibly one of the, the least fun bits of water that we were on, but it was very pretty and at least the weather was nice, right? Um, we also um, made the startling revelation that, um, that um, PFDs work really well in bottomless mud as well as water. Um, this was in the Webster Creek area. Um, it was basically an inch or two of water over, as far as Brent could tell, bottomless mud. Um, so moving the canoe through this was a particularly fun challenge. Um, so we also got to experience lots of smoke. Um, it was pretty clear for most of our time in the park and we're super lucky that we weren't directly impacted by the huge areas of forest fires that occurred this summer. Um, I looked up the temperatures though in Armstrong during the time that we were traveling and the time that we were having the most epic portage clearing also coincided with that giant heat wave that we had in, in Northwestern Ontario and I think throughout Ontario and possibly throughout, you know, Northern North America, I'm not even sure. Um, so it hit about 35 degrees Celsius in Armstrong, which is quite warm when you're trying to portage and clear portage at the same time. Um, this was kind of an academically exciting spot that wasn't really very exciting in practice. This is the confluence between the Albany River and the Michikai River. And again, you can see how low the water was. So this was quite a relief to join a big fast river that had a whole bunch more water in it. Um, it made for a lot less bumping and grinding at this point. And then right at the end of our trip, um, this was the float plane that came to grab us, um, came into Miminuska Lake and kind of mid morning. And that was the end of our trip. And we, we flew out over this incredible um, area. We didn't actually fly out over the route that we traveled, unfortunately, but we, we flew for almost an hour over the whole area that is almost completely protected, which really, meant, I tend not to get very emotional about these things, but, but it was really, incredibly pleasing and rewarding to, to see such an important place protected um, and to be able to spend all that time in there. It was a real, real privilege to be able to do that and also a real privilege to be able to share it with you tonight. Um, and with that, I will end. Um, this is a pretty photo that Brent took. Um, and if there's time, I'll take any questions either now or, or at the end. Yeah, we have time for a, a question or two right now, and then we'll start in with Joe. What was your favorite, very favorite part of the trip? <laughs> um, I think my favorite part of the trip was after about the fifth or sixth day when the headwind stopped <laughs> um, and we could kind of hear the birds singing a bit more and relax a little bit and kind of putter around a little bit more. Um, so that was definitely a highlight when the, when the wind stopped and, and we didn't have to use our whitewater skills on lake, on flat lakes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. David Shi asks, uh, review again, please, your bug management daily practices. Bug management daily practices, good question. Um, so I'm lazy, so I, stay in the tent while Brent goes and makes breakfast. Um, but actually what I was doing then was packing the tent up with the zips thoroughly closed, um, packing up all of our gear. Because um, we didn't have any off days, we moved every single day. So every day we had to take the tent down and put it back up again. So I kind of pack things up from the inside to minimize bug exposure and keep them out. Um, we were wearing long sleeve pants, and long sleeve shirts the whole time, partly for sun protection and, and trying to exclude ticks, which we didn't actually find any ticks, but um, that kept the bugs off. Um, we'd use DEET on, on our shoulders and our hands in places that were easily exposed. Um, and a sun hat with a, a head net at times when it was necessary. So most of the time when we're actually paddling, the bug net was not necessary. Um, but when we're kind of putting up camp and dismantling camp, then a bug net made things a bit more comfortable. Um, early on, it was fairly black fly -y, and then it switched to be mostly mosquitoes. But I feel like the black flies kind of came back as we went north as well. Um, so I think I've experienced worse bugs. I mean, I've done, we've done field work up in the Yukon and, and other parts of the world where, where bugs are actually worse. but um, just a combination of kind of keeping moving and camping in nice open spots where there's there's good airflow um, and then also having our, our no bug zone tent thing was was really nice on especially when it wasn't windy and then the bugs came out a lot more don't know if that helps <laughs> yeah terrific. 
Okay, we, we've got some feedback there. Um, okay, Meharry, uh, stick around and maybe we'll have a few more questions uh, a little bit later. Uh, I think we'll turn it now to to Joe. Joe Tusignant, did I say that right, Joe? You're Joe, you're muted. There we go. Tusignant, but you did a pretty good job. Yes, Tusignant. Tusignant. Tusignant, okay. Look at that. Larry, that was an awesome job you did. You really uh, showed me up on this. I'm following up, I'm a great presenter. Um, yeah, pleased to be here with everybody uh, sharing this uh, Sunday evening. I'm, I'm flattered that I was asked to do this, uh, being a being a newbie, one-time uh, Wabakini paddler. But uh, I first started going on trips to the boreal in 2012 with my daughter here. Um, this is a picture from our first trip when she was a tender young age of 15. And that was to the, uh, that was to the Boundary Waters. So um, since then we've done, well, I've done uh, 16 trips up to the Boreal. We, we started in the, in the Boundary Waters, uh, moved on to Quetico, did Quetico several times. Um, wanted some more adventure, went to Woodland Caribou a couple times. And then with, with COVID, we were forced uh, back, to, back to Boundary Waters. And as you know, this, this past summer got really interesting with uh, the border being closed, uh, eventually open, opening August 9th. Uh, Woodland Caribou closing, Quetico uh, closing, at least in parts. And uh, our fall trip that we had scheduled was to the Boundary Waters. Uh, we thought it would be just too tough to pull off a, a cross-border uh, trip with all the extra logistics and everything. But it, uh, it then the, the Boundary Waters caught fire and they closed the part of the park that we were going to go to. So. It was literally uh, about 10 days to two weeks out from, from our, our planned dates that were very inflexible. I had a wedding to go to on the uh, tail end of the trip on the way home, basically. And uh, so Wabakimi actually seemed like it was doable. It was open. It wasn't on fire. Uh, the border was open. And here I was 10 days out. Uh, just a little bit about how we travel. Ever since we started going, Caroline and I have used uh, Kruger canoes. Kruger Sea Wind on the on the left side of this picture. That's actually a Mad River Monarch on the right. This is an old picture. Uh, we now use two Kruger Sea Winds. They are solo canoes. They weigh about 55 pounds a piece. They have a wonderful uh, tractor seat that flips over to a excellent portage yoke. What I like about them is we can catamaran them up with that that pole you can see there and so you have an extremely stable platform. It's wonderful to fish from. It's completely safe. It's excellent in wind and waves. You're not going to capsize. You can stand up in a boat. You can net each other's fish, take pictures uh, and, and do all that and it, it's really fun as when we're fishing that I can, I can uh, point the boat in the right direction and tell Caroline where to cast. And when, uh, when it works out, it's just really fun. So anyways, I was 10 days out wanting to go to Wabakini and literally all I owned was, was a, pap, a paper Ontario parks map and uh, a lot of misconceptions about Wab Wabakini. And Fortunately, I, I looked up the Wabakimi Canoe Outfitters website, wabakimi.com, and uh, got in touch with Bruce Heyer at, uh, as the outfitter. And I can just tell you, it, it would have never happened without me hiring Bruce and, and having Bruce's help. Um, he, he set us up on a, on a trip that, uh, I hope to duplicate again sometime, but with, with 10 days before the trip. So 
you know, it was it was really interesting uh, getting across the border. Of course, we had to have vaccines. Uh, we had to get a, a COVID test within 72 hours of crossing the border. We had to put an app on our phone to upload our information. Uh, we had to list our uh, quarantine plan. So it was really good to have an outfitter's address put down as our quarantine plan. Uh, should we should we uh, end up being positive for the virus? I say that because we were we were randomly selected for random COVID testing at the border, and uh, got that done in in the seats of our truck and dropped off at a overnight couriers box in Thunder Bay. So that that was a little a little interesting. So uh, one of the great things about working with Bruce was uh, one we we got to Armstrong and he put us up at his lodge, uh, had a wonderful dinner, uh, great sleeping arrangements, great breakfast, all that taken care of. He sent us uh, PDF maps of our route, you know, recommended a route based on on what we wanted to do, and uh, sent us those maps. So I kind of marked them up. And, and laminated them and brought them with us. And so that, that was a big relief to uh, know where we were going and have the right resources. Um, I did use Paddle Planner and, and download a, a route on my GPS as well as on my inReach. I did use an inReach. So uh, here we are at the dock in front of the, the lodge. Uh, and the, the biggest shout out to, to Bruce was how he made this trip happen for us. Because we have two solo canoes, uh, using a, a Beaver aircraft is, is out of the question. In Ontario, they can only hold one canoe at a time. And, and I've never been in a financial situation where I could afford uh, chartering an otter or, or two beaver flights to get us in or, or out. So we've always uh, truck shuttled, paddled in, paddled out, that type of thing. So there's uh, my Kruger sitting there. You can see it's got a rudder on it. Uh, the other Kruger is already loaded on the, on the otter. Well, what, what Bruce did for us was, was he had a, I'm pretty sure he had a beaver going to take uh, a crew in to his uh, lodge and it was gonna pick up uh, another crew on the way out. So what by, I, I believe he upgraded us to an otter. The crew going in wasn't taking canoes. So we actually split the cost of this otter flight three ways and it was uh, surprisingly uh, affordable. So we did a one way trip where we flew out of Armstrong to Burnt Rock and he, we dropped the other party off at the lodge and uh, kicked Caroline and I out on a lake and we paddled away uh, destination, Little Caribou Lake outside Armstrong. Uh, one, way, one way trip, it was about 90 miles on the water and uh, about 11 miles of, of portaging as we uh, double portage on the way out. So it was gonna be uh, originally a 10 day trip and uh, doing 100 miles, that, that's about average of what, uh, what we've always done on these trips. So there's a shot of the, uh, of the route you can see there. Let me see my cursor, no, yeah, there it is. So there's the cabin up there and we paddled the Palisade the Grayson, uh, the Berg, down to Smooth Rock, out to the Caribou River, out Caribou, Little Caribou. So that was a fairly ambitious trip. I thought for the time frame we uh, we didn't have any layover days built in or anything like that. Um, here's one of the one of the maps that uh, Bruce provided it and we marked up and I I laminated before we went uh, just to show you the what he has to offer as part of his services and I found these maps to be very very accurate uh, his advice was wonderful 
and uh, that was that was a major uh, benefit of, of using using Bruce as our outfitter. So one thing I want to point out on this and and when you're when you're planning trips, the uh, you know you want the portages to be open. You, you you don't want to get caught in a bunch of blowdown portages where there's only one way through them and you have a limited time to uh, to make it back with no no layover days or anything. So uh, having a recommended route and and uh, kind of known portage conditions was was really nice. Uh, all these portages had been uh, maintained probably twice in the last two years. Uh, Bruce had a, a couple guests that took chainsaws with him and did a lot of work. Uh, as evidenced from, from uh, portage work, sawdust uh, from this year as well as last year. So it, I was pretty happy to say that over, over a 90 mile trip or 100 mile trip, we had one blowdown that I had to put the canoe over top of it and climb under and get back under the canoe and take off. That was the worst uh, portage experience we had the whole, the whole 100 miles. So the portages were in, were in excellent shape. I uh, do want to point out on this particular one, we were coming down the Palisade River and uh, heading for Slim Lake. And I can tell you, you don't, you know, on the, on the, large uh, paper maps there's a route shown through here from the palisade to the slim river where you would avoid most of slim lake well that excuse me i just fast forwarded that particular portage right there um, just doesn't exist that 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 route just doesn't exist it, Looks like it hasn't been attempted, been maintained in years, and no real good reason for it. There's a wonderful uh, paddle to the south, and and some swifts and runs to get into Slim Lake. So uh, just want to point that kind of thing out. So as we paddled, basically, we we found out pretty early that um, we weren't going as fast as we thought. Uh, we were going to be working this trip to get back in, in a time frame we, we planned on. Uh, it was just kind of slower going. I'll comment on that a little bit later. But, uh, you know, when I'm, we saw a good fishing spot below a falls or, or below a rapids, we took advantage of it as we paddled. And this was a September trip. Um, so the, day, the days were shorter. But we caught fish as we were traveling. And uh, we did eat fish every night. We had lots of good walleye meals on the way. Um, but fishing during the day, that, that's part of the reason why you don't go as far, too. Um, so, yeah, always fish below the falls. So a few fun things or highlights of the trip. My, my daughter just thought it was really neat to find these moose skeletons. Uh, we found two different uh sets of remains on the way fairly fresh uh it was just interesting to see the evidence of the char the charismatic megafauna we like to call them as we went along there's another one we <laughs> she found just has a big beaming smile on her face with her discovery so that was lots of fun um overall on the whole route we didn't see a single canoeist the whole way uh, the only humans we saw was towards the tail end of the, of the trip. We were headed east on Smooth Rock uh, with a a huge tailwind. We were we were surfing the boats uh, going east in in three or four foot rollers. It was it was pretty sporty conditions, and at that point we saw a small maybe a fourteen foot aluminum V bottom boat with three three people in it headed west into the wind and they were they were splashing around quite a bit. I think we were safer and having more fun than they were, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and other than those those three individuals, we didn't see anybody in the park. Uh, we saw a couple of fishing boats on, on Caribou. 
uh, the the last day of the paddle out the day we paddled out. So that that was expected. Uh, but overall, again, our 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 progress was was slow going and a little un, unexpected. You know, after 16 trips, I have a general feeling for how long I like to paddle every day, how far we go. Um, and I don't know what the combination of reasons, it, it seemed to be slower going. Maybe we were fishing more on the way. Uh, a lot of the portage landings were rough, uh, with big boulders and things. You're not going to find too many sandy beaches to, to pull up on at the uh, starter end of a portage. So it takes more time to get to get in and out and get loaded and, and going when you're doing those portages. Uh, lining rapids, uh, dragging boats up and downstream through 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 rapids and rock gardens uh, slows you down for sure. Uh, we did paddle in an upstream direction, so there's a little bit of speed loss there, uh, although the current wasn't particularly bad. Uh, fierce winds, you know, except for that one day on smooth rock, the winds were always in our face. So we weren't, we weren't really getting the, the miles in on the water we expected every day. And, uh, and, and the days are short. So, you know, instead of getting to camp, setting up camp and going fishing, which is uh, something we, we typically do, we were catching our fish on the way and pulling the camp later in the afternoon, uh, early evening, uh, setting up camp, cook fish, enjoy the evening. Uh, so it was just kind of a different, a different experience, but uh, just definitely didn't make the miles per day that that I was used to in other places. But they were they were wonderful miles uh, as we made them. So you know it is what it is. Uh, again, most of the portages were in excellent shape. When we were going uh, upstream on on one of the rivers, the Palisade, the Grayson. Uh, the berg, if we were going upstream, I should say. Uh, some of those portages were pretty brushy because I, I expect that folks who were going downstream and the other direction weren't using those portages. So all those portages seemed to be used about half as much and they were just, just brushier, but uh, we never never would get, get lost or, or have any trouble navigating. The wonderful thing about a September trip is there's no bugs. Uh, the whole time we didn't we didn't have a tick a black fly or hardly any mosquitoes the whole time so that was uh, that was really wonderful and great thing about the September trips and there's the the takeout uh, there on on uh, Caribou Lake Road where uh, pulled out and and Vince from Wabakimi Canoe Outfitters. Who's on here tonight? Hey Vince. Uh, he drove my truck up to, to meet us and, and we loaded my canoes up late one afternoon and drove back to Armstrong for uh, another wonderful meal and uh, warm, uh, dry, soft bed for the evening. And uh, we left out of Armstrong the next day to uh, cross the border and go back to, to Duluth. So uh, highly, Highly recommend using Wabakimi Canoe Outfitters. The food was great. Accommodations were great. It was just, I had absolutely zero complaints. So when it comes down to, you know, what we can do to make these trips a better experience for, for other travelers, um, I really, I, I, recommend using all the resources that you got out there. Um, whether, you know, I absolutely support the outfitters. They they get us into the park, they get us out. Uh, there are our ground crew, you know, our, our ground contacts. They were our, our potential quarantine spot should we had to have one. Uh, and it, it, was, it was economical and, and just worked out wonderful. Uh, I would like to encourage folks to uh, support the, the paddle planner. Uh, if you're not if you're not using paddle planner, uh, look look into it. 
and I think this can really help us all out, whether or not we use an outfitter and Bruce's maps and and the uh, Friends of Wabakimi maps. This is this is another resource that that adds uh, adds to it, makes trip planning a little bit easier, and it's a way it's a great way to share information. So so for example, um, here's that spot where where this portage was completely you know just obliterated over time and, and, and unmaintained. So after I got back, I uh, got on Paddle Planner and click on that portage. And uh, here's a here's a comment I put in there. I was there on the 15th. We're not, not seeing it. We're not seeing it, yo. Am I not sharing my screen right now? Okay, let me. You need, to, you need to exit from the program you're in and then go to your to your other. Okay. All right, you're not seeing it here, right? Correct. We're not seeing it yet. Okay. There we go. Oh, sweet. Okay. So again, uh, that that's here's that particular route I was telling you about, Slim Lake down here in Scrag Lake. Here, there's a Slim River. Um, my when I had planned the route, I planned it on on Paddle Planner, and it actually sent me through here. So that we pulled up to a portage and supposed portage, and, and, and couldn't find it, and eventually found a couple old cut surfaces on trees and things to realize, yes, I was in the right place, but with that, that portage was, was no longer there. So um, once I got back, I, I, I redid my route on Paddle Planner uh, just for historical purposes, I guess, record keeping, so to speak. But, but there's, there's my comment on, on that. So, you know, we can help each other out if we use this um, and, and share information on, on that, it'll make all our route planning easier. Um, but also mention it to your outfitter, mention it to, you know, work with the, uh, the mapping committee on Friends of Wabakimi, because all these efforts, they all complement each other. And, and I just, uh, it, it all makes it easier. Another uh, suggestion, you know we're out there paddling and fishing and doing all this and and uh it's not easy to stop and take notes and all these portages tend to to run together and so so this year i actually brought a little voice recorder with me out of my shirt pocket and every time i did a uh anytime i saw or anything notable whether it was a a uh a great portage a great campsite or whatever the case may be, I, I made a little note and it was really, you know, enjoyable spending an evening going over my voice recordings and uh, hearing a tone of my voice and, and, and kind of re-experiencing some of those things. Um, one of my, you know, portages uh, I did and at the end of it, I got on there and I was like, well, yeah, that was, that was a heart attack hill portage. I was breathing really hard and it was kind of a neat, <laughs> Uh, you know, I wasn't going to be sitting in camp remembering exactly which portage that was. So that really helped. And then every every day, if if I have time, we get back to camp, and I like to use a little waterproof waterproof paper notebook and and make a few more notes in there about what we what we experienced for the day, so we can go back and reminisce on that. Uh, so come back and, and 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 write trip reports. I'm not. Uh, the best trip report writer, but uh, I was kind of mechanical, I think, in mine. Gave a lot of information, maybe, but not a whole lot of eloquence about it. So it is what it is, but but I read other people's trip reports, and I really appreciate every one of them. Because, uh, again, you know, my attitude going into it was the park seemed uh, kind of like information was lacking. It was hard to figure figure out how does this work you know where where do you start where do you where do you get the maps 
uh, where do you stay? Is it white water? Is it flat water? It, just to try to get a whole feel for the park was really, really kind of tough. Um, however, once I decided, hey, I'm going, I immediately joined Friends of Wabakimi and I ordered some of their maps and their route planning guide and all that. But, but shoot, it came in the mail a day before I left. So I was in a real, real tight spot there. So again, uh, Bruce uh, bailed me out and, and made us uh, just have a, a, a most wonderful trip. And, and it's now, you know, my, my favorite place and uh, I will be back. There's no question about it. Um, and the fact that, that Woodland Caribou uh, had such a uh, hard fire season this last year, uh, Wabakimi is beautiful. Uh, the trip was not a whitewater trip. Uh, we didn't, like I said, we didn't see hardly any, any motorboat traffic. And those were the kinds of things that were misconceptions. Uh, I heard there was a lot of fishermen out there, a lot of motorboats, a lot of lodges. Um, and, and that a lot of the trips were whitewater and you wanted to be in a, in a Royal X type of canoe, but, but no, this trip was totally suitable for a, for a Kevlar canoe, uh, being in the fall, especially there, there was nobody at any of the lodges after we left the lodge at Burnt Rock. We never saw, saw anybody uh, except that one boat on Smooth Rock. So you know, the, the, the outfitter services was great. I'll, I'll never stop going on and on about that. It does, it does cost more, I understand. Uh, I've always, you know, freelanced more than that. I've never had to get maps from the outfitter. Uh, I hadn't used their lodge and things like that. We've done some truck shuttles and things at, at Woodland Caribou, but I, I was never really a user of an outfitter. Um, so, you know, maybe freelancing at Armstrong, at Armstrong is, is tougher. You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions. You know, if, if you want to freelance, uh, it'd be great if we could share information about, well, where, you know, what are your services in Armstrong for food and lodging and things like that? Can you park a car or a truck somewhere safely? Um, but it sure, it, you know, aside from writing a check, uh, using the outfitter was the way to go for, for us. Knowing our vehicle is safe and, and having a, a great stay at the lodge the, the day before and on the, on the paddle out, but just, just all worked out really well. So I'm right at 25 minutes. I, okay. I was prepared to give some fishing, tri fishing tips, but uh, we're out of time. So do we, do we have some questions for Joe? Joe, you said you had a favorite fishing lure. All right, I'll show you. <laughs> That's what I've been waiting for. This is the Big Bite Baits. Big Bite Baits, and that is a five-inch fat grub. You put that on a jig? Yes. You use those on, on quarter-ounce jig heads. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, those... Those are a lot easier to fish when you're in a lot of wind, the boat's moving, a lot of current, you want to get, get down. Okay. Um, the pumpkin seed, chartreuse tail, or crayfish colors. Yeah. Chartreuse. I caught more fish on these, these uh, the two trips I did in 2021 than, than anything else. If, it, if it's not too windy, I size down to a, a three-inch Berkeley power bait, power grub in uh, Christmas lights color. Christmas okay. lights. I love it. Wonderful color on a eighth inch jig head. We had somebody ask, uh, post a question earlier, would you work a layover, some layover days into your next trip? Absolutely. Um, our go-to trips have been uh, 14 day trips, oh. you know, about the same length overall. Uh, and, and I really do enjoy a, a couple layover days. Uh, this trip was abbreviated because again, I had to hit a wedding in Michigan on my way back south. So it, it started out as only being a, a, a 10 day trip and we actually came out in nine. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't have any layover days, unfortunately, but I, I'd recommend do we have at any, least have one, you know, for we have any, Do we have any other questions for Joe? I do have a, uh, this is Don Baumgartner, um, a, a tip for you. Um, the, using the jig heads, 
Uh, it'd be nice if everybody would leave lead alone and get rid of lead. Uh, that's, uh, it's hurting the wildlife. So, uh, well, and the planet for that matter. So, and it, and they're reasonably priced now too. So. Okay. We have a question. Do you ever sail the canoes when you have them linked together? I have, I have a sail, um, that I do use on my, on my canoes when I'm doing, uh, a race event I do down in Florida called the Everglades Challenge. Uh, unfortunately, the sail's not legal in Boundary Waters, and and I just never have taken it with me. But uh, I really kick myself for not bringing it this, this <laughs> trip to Lava King. I'll bring it next time. Both uh, Barry and Joe have written trip reports on the on the trip report uh, forum that we have on our website. So. Uh, and they both used uh, the form that MJ and her committee uh, put together. So we really, really appreciate the trip reports and all the work on uh, knowledge about the portages. I saw a question. The longest portage on my trip was, was I think, under 750 meters. That might have been the worst one. I think when they get up to about a thousand, that's where I start really noticing them. <laughs> so, okay. do we have? Yeah, any I think I think we were similar. Although Brent might remember better, I think seven hundred and fifty meters to about a kilometer. I think was as long as they got for us. That's correct. So. Uh, if we have any more questions, we could take another minute or two. Otherwise, it's been uh, really great reports tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Well, I'll be sure to tune in for these ones in the future. I, I really enjoyed Barry's and and uh, a shout out to Vince and right. a shout out to Bruce. I see you both on there. I don't see your smiling faces right now, but uh... <laughs> he's there, all right. So a week from tonight, we have uh, we have another another batch of reports. John Holmes is going to talk about his solo trip. Uh, Paul and Judy Dano uh, did a nice trip, and uh, Rob Clavins did a solo trip in a different part of the park. It'll be interesting to hear about, and they've all got written trip reports on our website as well. So I think that concludes uh, tonight's webinar.